Okay, and seeing folks joining, we're just gonna take a few moments and welcome everybody in and have a chance for folks to get oriented and settled. It's fun to see numbers pop up. Yeah, and to see everybody's mm -hmm. names joining. Hi, friends. Welcome, everyone. <laughs> All right. So if you're just joining, we're just taking a moment to let folks arrive. Um, and thanks for being here today. We're excited to see all the, the names populating the screen. Lots of familiar faces, well, names <laughs> that I associate with familiar faces. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna take just another 30 seconds or so before we get going. All right, it looks like we have a good number of folks joining and likely folks will continue to join. So we just welcome them in um, as we go uh, in, in starting. Um, it's wonderful to see all of your, your names and even though we can't see your faces, it's nice to, to be in community and see the, the names coming up and those joining us. So thank you, thank you for spending part of your Tuesday here today. Um, I will spend just shortly um, orient us to the structure and just the overview of the toolkit in today's um, agenda as we get going and then we'll move into some storytelling and conversation. Um, as, as I'm looking at more fo folks joining, it is really lovely to see all the names and to recognize the diversity of institutions and also geographic um, locations that folks are joining from today. Um, the people that you see on this Zoom um, today, we are joining from the Denver Boulder region of Colorado um, on lands belonging to the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute nations. Um, we start this webinar with a land acknowledgement as a reminder that our work is always situated within the context of history and in relation to people, lands, and sociopolitics. A central aim of participatory design and research is to hold present our contemporary as well as historical context. Recognizing the land and our institutions relationships with its original inhabitants helps to center the continued need to address her historical harms and aspire towards a vision of light and justice. As we start, I want to just briefly orient everyone to um, our agenda. Um, so you know what to expect. Um, I'm going to go ahead and give a brief introduction. Um, and that will include an introduction of um, the panelists that you see today, and then also an introduction to the toolkit and how to use it, um, and just an overview. Um, and then we will dive into two storytelling examples um, of these tools being used in context and in practice. Um, and then we will end with a question and answer session. So please, as you're going, take notes, write down thoughts or questionings, wonderings that you have, um, and we will invite those at the end of the hour. Mm -hmm. So to start, I want to introduce the, the team that we have present on, on Zoom today. But first to say that the team that you see represented um, helped to shape the structure and vision for this toolkit 
and authored many of the resources in it. Um, however, the group represented is by no means inclusive. There are many authors and editors who have contributed practices and resources that are also not present on screen right now. Um, and when you look at our website, you can see a more comprehensive list. Um, and we will be rolling out tools in phases. So more authors will be included in the rounds to come. Um, but just to name that this work has been made possible um, by the support of the Crown Institute and its members of um, Christine Jackson, who's been a project manager and many um, editors and thought partners who've been really, really attentive to thinking about how this will be used in different contexts. So we bring that collective energy with us um, while also noting that these practices have been developed over years um, and in collaboration with community members and young people. Um, this collective work has been developed and refined over time um, and has origins far beyond any of us and our work here today. Um, so I just, I provide that introduction just to bring forth um, the collective and historical work of these practices. Um, and as we share the introductions to who we are, just naming that um, there are many forces who um, are kind of standing with us um, as, we, as we share today. Um, so to start, I am going to uh, introduce a dear friend and colleague, Vanessa Roberts. Um, Vanessa is the executive director of Project Voice, um, which if you are not familiar with it, you should absolutely look it up. Um, it stands for Voices of Youth Creating Equity and is a youth-based leadership nonprofit in Denver. Um, Vanessa is a community-based scholar who works closely with youth practitioners and educators on projects co-designed to advance social change. Thank you so much, Leah, and welcome everyone. Loving the familiar faces from Ben Kirshner, who's been a significant part of my scholarly development, and then Celicia Lopez, who is formerly a community partner now at Crown. Um, so two of many names I could shout out. I just had to had to acknowledge I see you. Uh, but I have the great honor of introducing another colleague um, who's become a friend over the years. Uh, Dr. Bill Penuel. So Bill is a professor of learning sciences and human development in the School of Education at CU Boulder, um, also in the Institute of Cognitive Science at CU Boulder as well. He partners with educators in schools, districts, state agencies, and community organizations like Project Voice and some of our partners on a range of projects uh, focused on educational equity in STEM education. I've been really fortunate to work with Bill uh, for several, several years, and he's also a huge part of my community engaged, community based scholarship uh, approach. So thanks for being here, Bill. Thank you, Vanessa. It's so good to be here and to be with so many people that I have learned with and from on this journey, both uh, among other panelists, but also people who are here attending that uh, whose scholarship too that I draw on. So it's my pleasure to be able to introduce my friend and colleague, Susan Giroux. Susan is a professor in learning sciences and human development and uh, the Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity and Community Engagement at CU Boulder's School of Education. And something that she is working on is how to listen with humility and act with courage. Thank you, Bill. And everyone, thank you for being here. It's really fun. And uh, I see lots of learning sciences and human development folks from School of Education at Boulder. It's good to see you. Um, I have to calm myself down before I introduce um, Dr. Leah Teeters, because Leah was a collaborator of mine for many years and is a dear friend. And she really is, I think we can say, the like 
creative genius behind this whole idea of developing a toolkit. And she's really committed to like making these tools accessible for people to use, like to actually use and think about and make their own. So Leah is the Director of Outreach and Education at the Crown Institute at C. Boulder. Her background is as an educator, a researcher, and a community worker. And she brings an interdisciplinary approach to all of her work, especially in the work of doing participatory research and program development. So Leah, thank you so much for bringing us all together and to Christine behind the scenes. Well, thank you. Um... So we've introduced ourselves and now I'm going to go ahead and, and introduce a little bit of just an overview of what this toolkit is. Um, I'll share a little bit about the process um, of developing it uh, and then um, screen share some so I can just orient everyone to the resources that we have and how they can be used before we jump into some storytelling and um, discussion. Um, participatory design is central to enacting visions of more just futures. It seeks to bring forth the voices and perspectives of many collaborators, recognizing the role of diverse expertises and lived experiences. This toolkit was developed with, in, in a line with that orientation and has the aims of sharing practical resources um, that support research and design projects oriented towards care, connection, equity, and justice. The resources that you'll find in this toolkit fall under two categories, that of activities and then that of guidelines. The activities are written kind of like a lesson plan um, and for each one of them, uh, there is a rationale, a story of view, so that you can really think about how to not only kind of move through the steps or and adapt the steps to your context, but to really think about what it would mean in the space that, that you're working. Um, and just to name that all of these um, activities that have been shared, we've really thought about the theory of human activity, human development and learning. Um, so we aim to provide a brief summary of how it is connected um, to theories of human development, um, specifically oriented around um, well-being and equity. Um, and so you'll find those activities and then you'll also find guidelines um, and the guidelines are meant to be a starting point for reflection. Um, both are intended just to be starting points. Um, they are not intended to be linear or as a step by step. Here's, you know, start with this one, go with this one, and then, you know, you've completed participatory design. The idea is that they are not prescriptive nor comprehensive, but rather they are um, an invitation to bring curiosity, reflection, conversation, and collaboration um, in your local setting and context. Um, and so as you explore them, we invite you to bring an eye towards adaptation and considering what it would mean to be bringing these activities into your context. Um, in collaboration with the folks that you are with whom you're working. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just dig a little bit more specifically um, into the structure by sharing my screen. Um, so just be patient. Um, I have that, um, Christine, can you put on um, host that I'm able to have participant screen sharing? They went to do that. I just see that it's temporarily disabled. And as we do that, um, okay. All 
right, here we go. I think, um, Christine, I'm just going to go ahead and ask you if you can screen share um, and if you can screen share the website and we can just talk through um, the orientation of how these um, resources are organized so that we'll talk both through the different phases that we have um, and then the specific resources. Great. Um, so Christine, if you don't mind just scrolling down um, and we all, I, I'll share, you can see some of like the orienting text, um, but at, at the top, and then if you go down below is where you can click into the resources. Um, so great, if you don't mind just pausing there. Um, so we have organized the toolkit into five categories starting. Uh, with build trusted teams, really recognizing that um, trust and working with the premise that relationship is is first and primary to the the work that we do um, is really central. Um, and so that's we start with this build trusted teams and the resources within that help collaborative teams think about how to get to know each other, how to really understand the depth of expertise and lived experience of different collaborators who are coming together across um, disciplines and ages and cultural and racial and linguistic experiences and really thinking about how do we, how do we collectively leverage um, the assets of the whole group. So you, can look through those resources um, specifically if you're, you know, starting to build a team and really um, thinking about what that process may look like. Um, and once again, with the reminder that these uh, resources are not meant to be linear. Um, so just to name that building trust happens time and again throughout research and design processes. So we do invite and encourage um, exploration of these resources throughout a design cycle. And then the next phase that we have is identify and understand. Um, so the questions that, that lead the tools in this category are, what do we need to know about the places, the histories, and the people with whom we are working? How do we learn what we need to know? Um, so the resources that you'll find under identify and understand, help to answer those questions and to explore the, the context in which um, teams will be working and designing. Um, and then the third category of resources is organizing for design. And so this holds um, resources to help team members really answer the question of how can we plan and enact practices of collaboration that center care, dignity, and equity. Um, as, as we move into the process of getting into designing materials, whether it's curriculum or you know, research processes, it can, it can get really messy. Um, and it is helpful to, to really think about that complication um, as an asset that can be used um, in the collaborative process. Um, and some of these resources can be heuristics to help the team really think about um, how to bring in multiple voices into that design process. Um, and then the latter two categories, just to name, um, will be coming soon. We'll be sharing those resources um, in the near future. And that is evaluate and iterate. Um, and then sustain. And so the resources that within the category of evaluate and iterate will answer questions around how will we understand the impact of our designs and how can we improve upon both our processes and products. So really as we develop um, designs and research, 
materials, resources, how do we make sure that we're always collecting information and improving upon the process? How do we know if um, the intended impact has been what we set out for it to be? Um, and even to, to name that over time, perhaps what we, our intended goal may shift over time. And then lastly, um, the fifth category of resources will be under the category of sustain. Um, how do we sustain partnerships as well as products? Um, and how do we think about them living within local contexts and um, living responsibly um, in dialogue with, with the communities um, where they will reside? Um, so that is just a little bit of an overview. And then Christine, if you don't mind going back up to the top, we uh, just to share one um, click into, no, sorry, the uh, build trusted teams, <laughs> the top of the, the, and then click into view toolkit just to orient um, the, to the website. So um, clicking into maybe use art for multiple interpretations. Um, so what you'll see is a PDF that, is the tool itself that talks through first the aims of the activity or the guidelines. Um, we'll share a summary of how the activity can be used as well as a rationale for why would you use it? Why is this needed? Where may it be helpful? Um, what are just kind of some orienting um, perspectives going into it? And then um, we outline steps um, as far as how to bring these activities into practice. Um, and once again, in the process of sharing the steps, really an invitation to think about modifications, virtual adaptations. Um, you know, you may be working with different numbers of collaborators. Um, so we just share a number of suggestions and starting points for thinking about how you may want to adapt this in your context. Um, and then just some very tangible tips around what materials might you need, what are some things to think about in preparation. Um, and then the last two categories that um, the tool will share are some examples from the field so that you can hear how different teams have brought these practices into their research and design spaces. Um, and hopefully these just serve as a place to, to make it more real, to, to help folks think about how they may use it. Um, and then ending with how the activity is connected to commitments of equity and wellness. Um, and in this section around commitments to equity and wellness, really naming that in the process of engaging in participatory research, um, that the process is the thing. Um, so often in so many places in, in our lives, we can focus on the product and really it is the process of how we collaborate um, how we orient to each other as collaborators and colleagues and friends um, that, that enables the product to embody um, that, the aims that we have for, for our research and design. Um, so really thinking about, you know, we've shared um, the commitments to equity and wellness and writing through this, but then I would encourage you as you're exploring these resources to think about in your context, in your work, um, in your institution's kind of value structure, how can um, the commitments to equity and wellness be brought through um, both in the process as well as the product. Um, Christine, thanks so much for, for sharing um, the screen. And yeah, at, at the end of that, you were just seeing that there would be some additional reading if you wanted to dig into um, more of the academic literature behind some of these practices and then um, work cited. Um, always, that, that is actually always really helpful to dig into some of the literature that we have drawn on. 
um, over time and been in dialogue with as we've been thinking about these. Um, so that's just a little bit of an orientation to the resources that are shared in this website. Um, and we will have some time at the end to open up for questions. Um, and so I encourage you to think about those if there were things that came up as um, we we're doing that screen share to jot those down so that we can come back to them. Um, now we are going to move into thinking about how these have been used in practice um, and starting about just sharing the resources and um, a case of practical use. So starting with Bill Penwell, who will be sharing um, about the participatory design inventory. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to you, Bill. Thanks, Leah. Um, so I'm really excited to share this particular tool, and I want to acknowledge that this is a deep revision of um, an activity that I learned from my colleague Ken Frank that he used to call social bingo. And what he would do is try to anticipate, and I've done this in design work before, some of the life experiences and relevant expertise that might be involved in co-design work as a way to help build a team, you know, and this is a tool that's in the category of learning to build a team or of building a team. And in the same spirit, this particular inventory has as a core purpose, really getting to know the people and the skills that they bring to participatory design. Um, the revision is really grounded in this appreciation and understanding of the multifaceted nature of what participatory design is. And the challenge of all participatory design is to create that which does not exist in ways that allow for people to participate in ways that you don't always can't an anticipate ahead of time and contribute. Um, and yet, you know, I think the paradox is if without a little bit of formality and structure, it's really easy to replicate uh, problematic power dynamics. Um, and also not get where you hope to go, not invent something really new and, uh, and get beyond what is presently available. Um, so the tool kind of uh, evolved from an understanding of thinking about and working with people to and drawing on the literature about what are some of the sorts of formal ways that people um, can be involved in participatory design that they might bring as assets to the experience as well as what are some of the ways that people are very skilled in attending to and uh, informing relational dynamics and emergent goals that you can't plan for. And how do we actually, um, if people feel like, well, I've never done something called participatory design, how do they come to feel like they can contribute because they bring relevant experiences uh, uh, to the table? So this really builds from a strengths-based perspective helping people to identify a range of possible skills and experiences they might bring to joint work at the start of a process and what they might want to learn to do. Um, and discussing these skills, I think, can help teams and partnerships to get to know each other and also to develop some sense of trust in what is an unfamiliar process. Uh, and for always, always challenging um, what we think we know. There's a wonderful definition of boundary crossing, I believe from Lee Starr that says that we always feel like we're a little bit on the territory of the other. Um, and I think if we don't feel that way, we're probably not doing participatory design. So this allows us to feel that we might be on the territory of the, of, uh, that's unfamiliar, but somebody is familiar with the territory we're working in. Um, and so this allows us to also really be intentional about what we're trying to transform in, in our relational um, dynamics as well. So what happens in this, and maybe uh, Christine, you can project this activity sheet uh, or, or just share it in the chat is fine, is that collaborators would, would complete this inventory of experiences or goals. And you can see a click through there. Um, and there's a list of different both formal and informal kinds of skills to think about. 
experiences that people bring. And they would do that largely on their own. And notice we've got both experiences as either a participant or facilitator, and also areas that are very explicit about growth. Where do I want to grow? Um, and if conducted during a meeting, one of the things that I've learned is it's good to just allow people plenty of time, at least 15 minutes, for people who are collaborators to really just take the time to, to do this writing before sharing uh, work, because it gives a little bit more uh, opportunity for people to have think time and be thoughtful about that. Some collaborators may need more thinking time and asking people to complete this between two meetings can benefit those. And then often what we'll do is share this in pairs, um, which feels often safer to do in terms of sharing those strengths. And then uh, either have one person report out uh, for both and share those and also creating a public record of some of those experiences on Witcher Black Paper. Um, it's, I, I think a promising practice here is to really make this a living thing to come back to. Uh, whoever is facilitating a particular meeting, really calling to mind and remembering to really bring ex uh, experiences forth at relevant moments. I mean, also that's the challenge is how do you make this a living document, not something that you just do once and leave behind as a lot of sort of built team building activities sometimes can be. Um, I've used this activity in the context of both uh, research practice partnerships and also in courses we're working with um, people learning partnership or learning co-design, uh, including a recent uh, course on curriculum uh, co-design that I was leading with my colleague Arturo Cortez at CU. Um, and in that particular class, just to give a more concrete example, we were working with both youth and adult partners who were about to engage in some work of co-design of a unit that centered in middle school AI education, artificial intelligence. And the course took place entirely in Zoom um, and after being introduced to the activity, um, we had different subteams of folks who met in breakout to complete their sheets individually, and then added to an, a Jamboard, uh, a common place to record these um, skills and experiences they saw as strengths, and also ones that they hope to develop through co-design. We then discussed as a group, what are some patterns and, that they noticed in terms of skills brought as well as they hope to learn? And one of the things that was a really common theme was wanting to really learn how to structure ideation processes that amplify voices without power. So people are really concerned and interested, and that was a collective learning thing that they wanted to develop. And so we developed another activity around that to discuss what that could mean and what, what they hope to learn. Um, other contexts where I've used this in courses and workshops, people have said this is useful. This is feedback on this. That, it provides some structure around introducing various roles and ideas within a project, can also help how to distribute leadership in a group. And another comment that uh, some students made who experienced this where it's helpful in thinking about some of the routine work that we do or should be doing in facilitating participatory design and also what might be missing for it. Just seeing the categories can help you open up new spaces of things to be thinking about. And it's just something I think, uh, particularly with respect to atten attention to power, is as a field in participatory design, this is certainly a growing wow. edge. And so excited some of the people uh, who are attendees here who are thinking about this very carefully in their work. Uh, and how do we do that in the ways that we structure and engage in participatory design? And I think I'm handing this off to Vanessa to talk about the superpowers activity. Thank you, Bill. It was really lovely to hear you flesh that out again. It's been a while since we worked on that tool in particular. Uh, so yeah, again, welcome everyone. Um, it's really great to be in this space and to see all the interest in participatory research, participatory design, more collaboration, and the tool that I wanted to highlight um, is near and dear to my heart, and it's the superpower activity, uh, the superpower superhero activity. So that was just dropped into the chat for you as well. And you're welcome to share the, the screen um, if you'd like, Christine, to give folks a visual orientation point as well. 
But the reason why I love this activity um, is that it was it's actually a co-creation between myself and some of the Project Voice youth leaders um, from several years ago. So one of the things I love about the work I get to do with Project Voice, and I've been the ED since 2019, but I've been involved uh, since 2016 um, as uh, formerly a facilitator and curriculum designer. And there's a intentionality about co-creation and co-design. And so the tool that you have in front of you came out of this um, need, this urge to really address differential power dynamics in a space. So we work a lot with youth in, um, in an intentional way to amplify their self-advocacy, right? So that adults don't have to come in and rescue, adults don't always have to come in and correct our colleagues or our peers, right? But that youth themselves start to develop the tools and just like Bill was saying and earlier Leah, and like you'll hear as a recurring theme in participatory design is that relationships are at the heart of this work. Um, I had another colleague of mine in a different space say that he thinks about trust as a form of currency. So how rich are you as a practitioner, as a scholar um, in this work? What is your level of trust currency? So. This activity came about through several uh, iterations with young folks, what worked, what didn't. And so the core idea behind it is to get folks involved in an equalizing activity. The basics are the facilitator sets up a prompt like, all right, folks, superheroes, who's your favorite superhero? Who do you want to be like? Who do you admire? Right. Just to get folks in that imaginative, non-academic, non-project space, right, activates a different part of your thinking. And then from there, shifting into some key examples, especially if you're not getting a lot of diverse examples, right, if you're just getting Batman, Superman, how do we diversify um, those examples, right, those models, and then also thinking about paying attention to the fact that not everybody is well-versed in superhero culture, not everybody has that same cultural reference point, so being prepared, doing some of your research in advance, to be ready to push your participants to think a bit deeper, and then, of course, from there, you ask folks, all right, here's our reason for being together. Sometimes you'll have a driving research question. Sometimes you'll just have a purpose for your collaborative project. What do we need, right, um, to think about in order to frame the next part of the activity, which is asking folks to take the time to design their own superhero. So if you were a superhero, who would you be, right? What is your superpower? What is your downfall, right? Uh, what's your costume and why? Like what's your origin story? And so really getting folks to dig in to their own assets that they're bringing to the table. And then after they have the time to create, facilitator can move around, check in, answer questions, follow up, right? You do what we call a gallery walk. And this is one of the things that the youth really pushed for was not just like a stand up show and tell but an active movement around the space. And to have a gallery walk where the audience interprets the person's superhero and starts to think about based on what they see, what's the contribution to the, uh, to the group? What's the contribution to the collective project, the collective effort? And because everybody is standing up and presenting with the same amount of time, uh, with the same product, it starts to equalize and it starts to pull out personal details in a lower risk type of a way. It starts to engage folks in uh, personal storytelling. It starts to dissolve some of those artificial yet really reinforced boundaries of difference. So you have a tenured faculty member engaging with a high school student or with an undergraduate student or with someone else on the team who organizationally has far less power in humanizing ways. And so that's the power of this activity for me is really thinking about it's supporting equity, it's supporting wellness by increasing an awareness of the strengths that you're bringing and that they are in relationship to others and that they are equally valuable and equally in danger of being misused, misapplied, ignored, 
And so it opens up space to really have a robust dialogue and exchange around what are we bringing and how do we do it, but not in a cut and dry uh, listing type of a way. So one challenge with this, quite frankly, that I've seen is getting those who are a bit more stiff, right, who are a bit uh, perhaps resistant to things that are not so cut and dry, getting them to engage and to understand the purpose and the intent behind the activity. So that's one challenge I have found um, is encouraging the some of the adult participants, right, to actually embrace the activity, not as a waste of time, not as like, you know, a touchy feely, I guess I have to do this type of a thing, but seeing it as a core part of the process overall. And the other thing I really appreciated in connecting this with what Bill just shared is that throughout the course of a project, this gets referred to often, right? Because the way that you can nuance the debrief after the gallery walk is to think about which of these powers naturally work together and which of these might potentially repel or potentially be in contrast. And so it also sets you up to start to pay attention to different assumed modes of being in the group, right? So are folks always open for, you know, loose ideation? Um, or is that that person who will get really anxious if things aren't getting written down, if things aren't moving forward? And so it gives you a chance if you're the project lead or the PI on a project, right? To be able to figure out how best to facilitate collaboration amongst the group. So that for me is really the promising practice. I have one little, <clears throat> rug rat in my room, who of course wants to be really vocal right now, apologies. Um, but the promising practice there for me is it can really start to build those social bonds, which let's face it, is what sustains the work when it gets hard. Um, if I've learned anything in the years I've done particip participatory work, collaborative work, is do not underestimate the time needed to form the foundation and really to invest in that currency of trust. So I'll go ahead and pause there because I'd really like there to be a chance um, for engagement. Cool, it's my turn, it's my turn. And I get to like welcome everybody into what our conversations were like when we were making these tools and they were like fun and pushing each other and asking questions all the time. So I have questions for Bill and for Vanessa and really for Leah too, if you guys wanna, if you would like to jump in. I hear both of you saying things about, you know, the importance of imagination, you know, with play and creativity and also with Vanessa. And Bill, you were talking about like, imagine like, who do you wanna be in the future? And I, I think about that and I think, wow, the person who's gonna be facilitating this needs to have a lot of skills and like particular kinds of like a disposition towards doing this work. I would love to hear, and Vanessa, you started on this, but I'd love to hear you talk about what kinds of, you know, dispositions should facilitators maybe have and also try to cultivate. Either one can go first. I have a lot to say about this, Susan, as you know, from our years mm -hmm. of working together. Um, I think facilitation is an art, right? Um, I've been trained in facilitation that's a relational-based, um, Africana-centric, right? So that's the, the grounding that I have. And one of the key things in terms of like skills or disposition, I'll start with disposition. It's really assuming and knowing that you don't know everything, right? So the disposition is really orientation towards the expertise and ex value in the room. Right, it's this, and it's hard because we are so trained, especially those of us coming from a Western Academy perspective, that once I've gotten this degree, once I've gotten the certification, once I've gotten X amount of years of experience, I deserve to be held in this space, or I of course have this level of knowledge which supersedes. And that can be hard to unlearn, or it can be hard to be honest with yourself about what it feels like to share power. So I think an orientation 
a disposition, a willingness to share power is really, really huge. And then the other skill, quite frankly, um, I have a theatrical background, a uh, performance background, and the weird set of training I pull on the most is improv, right? So in improv, the main driving sort of um, mantra is always being willing to say, if you get posed with the challenge, if you get posed with the threat, if you get thrown off your game, the response is always yes and, right? So you always have this yes and, oh, I see you Sam, right? Uh, there's this yes and orientation, um, which can be really, really hard to internalize and to adopt and to have it be the reflexive natural response. And so there's something there for me, um, which is really, really key of setting yourself up a facilitator it's not about you it's about the process you're able to create by the container you hold for the shared learning and the shared experience and i'll stop Thank there thanks Vanessa. bill do you want to share your thoughts on this yeah um i think yeah building with sort of just having direct experience of being a participant in productive collaborations that felt good in some ways like I think you have to have that bring that disposition to to be able to imagine people in the space coming to the space and doing that and, and being part of the activity and also being part of the space and that's not always possible to imagine I, I was thinking specifically about the disposition that's needed for this tool to really adapt it well is I need to know a little bit of I kind of need to anticipate some of the experiences that people are bringing that are relevant. And one check for me as a facilitator is maybe I shouldn't do it alone because I don't know enough about who's in the room. And I need to even I need to, even to redesign that particular list of skills. I might need a partner to help me do that, who knows more of the people, because th that's the big story here is it's about the people. It's about, it's about who's in the room and what are they bringing? And how do we make that salient in the work, in the co-design and participatory work that we're doing? Um, and it's my first check to, if I can't build a, a bingo, a social bingo list of expertise, or I don't, if I can't do that, that's already a sign to me that I'm not ready to do this activity. I might need to bring some other people in and say to help me to get to the people because the bigger intent here is about, you know, how do we, um, really get to know each other for who's here and the things they're bringing to the work that we have to do together. Thanks. I'm go I mean, I just wanted to add one more thought because you know what I'm like. Um, <laughs> I think about a person needing to have the, like needing to be comfortable, like just kind of going with the flow, which is a little bit of the yes and, and it's also like, it's going to be messy and your expected outcome probably not going to be the outcome you're going to get, right? But that doesn't mean not having an outcome, like an idea in your mind, which I think will tie back to the soon, coming soon um, evaluation and sort of iteration tool that's going to be on the website. Um, my next question is really to ask you to a two-part question. So one is, this is really tied to both equity and wellness. You each touched on that a little bit, I would like you to like take a little bit longer to like expand on that because this is this is serious. You know, participatory design work is centrally about paying attention to people's lived experiences. But what does it have to do with you know wellness, for example? Welcome to start, Bill. We can okay. take turns. Sure. Um, for equity, I want to pick up on something that Vanessa mentioned, and I think. One of the assumptions behind this particular tool I shared too is a, a real sense of um, trying to deprivilege academic expertise as the sole thing that is there. And also binaries like um, that we can bring uh, between research and practice, whether practice is with community or schools around, oh, well, practice brings the practical stuff and researchers bring the theory. No, you know, part of equity is really seeing people as everyday theorists of their experience who have design ideas to lead the work, right? And for us to think about ourselves as practitioners in whatever space we are in, 
as scholars, you know, so we also have to think about our practice. So that's from that standpoint. Um, from wellness, the standpoint of wellness, I think one of the things that it's, it speaks to how one might adapt and customize these tools, um, in particular, the participatory design tool. Um, we need someone who's really attending to the well-being in the, uh, of participants at different moments in, in participatory design. The last two years have shown us many times where people show up together in a meeting and if we're not attending to the very beginning to people's well-being um we're probably we might launch into some try to launch into some work and it doesn't go anywhere or we might launch into work not knowing the ways that we need to attend to one another's well-being in that moment and so i think part of this is really beginning with centering well-being as um this is what we are about is transforming, the, the vision is about transformative possibilities about relationships, um, you know, uh, which I think that's one of the key goals as Shireen Basugi and Megan Bang say about participatory design is thinking about transform relations as a key goal in participatory design unto itself. And that's why wellness has to be, that's how for me wellness shows up. I like that a lot, Bill, and you touched on a lot of what I was jotting to share, right? I think I'll pick up and tune in more to towards the, the superpower activity because I think the, the link to make for folks is there's a robust field of research about arts-based approaches and the significance of arts-based approaches when it comes to this big question of wellness, right? And how is it that um, shifting how we think about uh, how we qualify work as high caliber, right? Or how we qualify work as um, research worthy or however y'all wanna frame it, right? That the arts get ignored and overlooked. It's one of the reasons why I opted for sociology as my doctorate discipline, because I came from performance studies, right? And I wanted to be able to prove or speak to y'all, this was 10 years ago, of course it shifted, but in the beginning, one of the big aims was talking about or wanting to be able to speak critically to the power of arts, the power of performance. And so for me, the arts-based approaches that you see in a lot of these activity guides are very much attuned to um, that discipline and the, the vast research done on the benefits of arts-based approaches. And then with equity in the superpower activity, you see it on a very micro scale where you see it as a means of tuning into and addressing equity within the team um, by having an opportunity to hold up and value equally the rich experiences that folks are bringing. And then as the project moves forward, the hope would be, of course, um, pulling in some ways from Adrian Marie, Marie Brown's emergent strategy and this notion of fractals, right? That it would spiral into having this broader effect. So that's the quick, the quick response. Thanks. I just dropped into the chat that like the arts-based approach is relevant for all ages, you know, and across you know, people have different linguistic backgrounds and ability backgrounds. So thank you for saying that, Vanessa. And I will pass it to Leah. Do you want to open it up? Yeah, I think in the, the last few minutes that we have, it'd be great um, to hear a, a bit from folks if there are any questions that have arose um, from really any part of this conversation from the beginning of just what's the toolkit again where is it um, or from the um, latter part of this conversation um, so we invite you to engage via the chat and we'll really just take um, about two to three questions um, before closing. So if there are any pressing questions, we invite you to include them in the chat. And if we are not able to get to all of them, we will follow up um, after this time um, via email to, to connect and make sure that your answer, your questions are answered. Yeah, 
I'll just sit here awkwardly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, maybe as, as you're thinking about your questions or typing them in, um, we'll also drop the link to the web page so that you know where to find these resources. Oh, here's a question. Victor Leos, right? Uh, that, uh -huh. that, that, is, um, that is our closing. That's a, a, a great question, Victor. Um, so we see um, the question of, will the toolkit be updated? What's new on the horizon with participatory work and the toolkit? Um, so yes, I think that the first answer is our intention is that this is a living toolkit. Um, and we're really hoping that it can grow and be collaboratively sourced. So it will be updated in two ways. Um, as, and many more that we can't envision right now, but two ways that we like concretely know will be next steps. Um, one is that we are hoping that this will be a, a community um, generated toolkit. So we really invite folks to collaborate with us and share their practices um, and contribute resources. So we will um, put the Crown Institute email address into the chat as well, but we would love to hear from you. If there are things that you're doing that you would love to collaborate and generate a tool. Um, so that's one way. Another way is that we would, if you use this, we would also love to hear from you to say like, this worked, this didn't. I was really confused by these steps. And you know, we've gone through that in the design process and it's always helpful to hear more feedback. So we're hoping to update it both by getting feedback from folks and engaging in processes of iteration, but also collecting more resources. And then, you know, really concretely to name that we have um, a few more resources and those latter two categories coming out. Um, so please stay, stay tuned and we'll stay in communication about the ways that they are updated. I'm going to raise the question that Molly Shea asked um, because it's a question I think about a lot and it's related, Molly says, to Vanessa and Bill's discussion of sharing power. She asks, how do you think about conveying that these exercises are related to design but not overly pushing design? Like, and I guess, and Molly, you can type into the chat, do you mean like the design of like a thing, like a particular kind of outcome or a product? She clarified down below, pushing the need to make people design a research project. Perfect, yeah. thanks. We can all think about that. I can start. I mean, a lot of times we're not designing a research project, we're designing a thing together. And um, it is a little bit easier to jump in when we don't have to have the, if we don't start with that intention, but sometimes, Sometimes doing service in co-design is a form of service that can lead into research questions that emerge out of the joint work as genuine questions that arise from the group about, you know, the particular design decision and what its consequences are and wanting to keep track of that uh, or its impact, questions of how it might be enacted. So sometimes it really helps to just start with the design without the research project in mind that's behind it. But really, and with this idea of this is actually something that's hopefully going to meet a need or help people pursue possibilities that they want to pursue. I'm actually going to take the question that just popped up from Nick Wilson. Um, and he, he says, they say, I don't know if there's time to respond to this, but I'd love to hear about some of the ways in which you all might actively work to decenter your own authority or to distribute authority among stakeholders in RPPs or research practice partnerships. I wanna say one thing about like decentering yourself. I do that a lot. I'm really good, I think, at recognizing other people's expertise. But I do wanna name that as a woman of color in a space where you're always decentering your expertise, there's a challenge there. There is a tension around how to also say, and I have expertise. So like decentering yourself doesn't mean completely forgetting that you actually have expertise as well. 
I'm going to pass it to the rest of the group to see what you think about that. I know we're at time, Leah, but I did quickly want to respond to this because I could, it connects also to what Ben Kirshner was asking about um, in the sense that one of the hardest things for me to learn was how to both hold power while actively acknowledging that my power is not better than yours. That's the, that's the trick, right? Is how do you have a, a space for multiplicity? And so this goes to Ben Kirshner's question about, you know, in the superpower activity, how do you get folks to acknowledge or recognize their strength when like they maybe don't have that readily available? And that came up a lot working with young folks. And the answer to that, and then also the answer to the question that was just posed is really related to storytelling and this ability to engage what I refer to as like radical vulnerability, right? Or uh, critical vulnerability. So it's vulnerability with a purpose. You're not just, you know, trying to uh, trauma bond with someone as um, our 17 year old likes to say, I'm not gonna trauma bond with you, right? But it's a way of sharing stories intentionally so that it's not like I'm suddenly at this level of my career, at this level of proficiency, without a whole host of experiences and failures that led up to it. And so that can also be really unsettling for those of us who have been raised for more like authoritative tra traditional type modes of um, engaging, but it's that power of owning who you are and what you bring to the table, but recognizing um, that my strengths, my powers are able to be activated and are able to come to their full uh, strength in relationship with others. It's no fun to hang out in a vacuum. So that's the, the response for me. Good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for those responses and the questions. And we didn't get to all of them. Um, and the hope is that this is just the, the starting point of this dialogue. Uh, once again, we're hoping that this whole toolkit will be living, but also community building, that we will be in dialogue with each other and that there will be many ways to engage, to collectively source practices and resources. So we really look forward to hearing from you, to following up, to creating community spaces, to, to figure out how to do this together, to answer and ask the questions that are, that are on all of our heads. Um, so in okay, kind of closing, um, if I just invite you to look at the website, make sure you have our um, email address at Crown Institute. We're also um, on Instagram and explore our website for additional opportunities to connect. We really look forward to building community and dialogue. Um, in the use of these resources. So thank you all for joining us today um, and bringing your attention and questions. We look forward to following up. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so much, everyone. Good.